Good evening. So the year is 1982, and I'm 12 years old. And I get a call that changed the course of my life. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey, honey, is your mom there? There's been an accident. You see, my dad worked at a steel mill, and he was an electrician, and he was working on a great big electrical panel, and it didn't get tagged properly. So while he was in there with the screwdriver, and his buddy Bob was in there with a flashlight, someone turned it on, and boom, it exploded, and it caught him on fire. Now, the good news is my dad survived, even though he's full of scars. The bad news is that I ended up with a bunch of scars on the inside. My life changed. I started worrying about when the next bad thing was going to happen. At any moment, something bad could happen. I stopped playing life to win, and I started playing not to lose. Ever feel that way? In fact, it set me on a course. So over the next 27 years, I decided I had to figure out how to train your brain to prepare you, not scare you. And so I'm here to share three strategies with you that are going to show you how to train your brain for success. Number one, focus on the outcome that you want. Your mind is like a GPS. You type in the destination you want to go, and it takes you there. The number one reason people don't get what they want is because, one, they don't know what they want, or two, they focus all their time on what they don't want, and what they're afraid of, and what they think might happen that they don't like. And wherever your attention goes, that's where your energy flows. So if you're focusing on what you don't want, guess what you get more of? So pay attention to the words you use when you're talking to yourself. For the parents in here, if you tell your child, don't throw that toy, what do they do? They throw the toy. Because your brain doesn't hear the word don't. It hears what comes after it. People will say, I can't stop eating. I don't know why. I'm having a hard time losing weight. I tell myself all day long, don't eat the cookies. Don't eat the cookies. You know what your mind hears? Eat the cookies. I used to drive down the highway and I would just cringe because I would see these billboards. Remember this slogan? Oh, not that one. This one. <laughs> Don't drink and drive. My brain said, okay. <laughs> because it only hears what comes after the don't. They changed the slogan to stay sober. Now my mind knows what to do. So when you're communicating with yourself, instead when someone says, how you doing? And you're saying, I'm a lot less stressed. Your mind hears the word stressed. Instead, say, I'm more calm. Oh, calm. What if you say, how you doing? Eh, not bad. Your mind hears bad. Instead, I'm doing pretty good. Now your mind just heard pretty and good. If I was teaching you customer service, and we just did a transaction, and you said thanks, and I said, you know, hey, no problem. What'd you just hear? Or maybe I'm really cool. Hey, no worries. Now you just associated problems and worries to me. I want you to associate my pleasure. So make sure you pay attention to the words you use because they're influencing your unconscious mind all the time. Number two, the key to lasting motivation is to associate pleasure to your goal and to the action steps that are going to get you there. The number one reason why people procrastinate is because they've associated pain to the goal, and so we push it aside. So we want to make sure that we're aware of what we're saying to ourselves. I had a client, Virginia, and she wanted me to help her lose weight. And so uh, I li was listening to her over talk, you know, over um, listening to her conversation. And she was explaining to her friends that she was just the best with her southern cooking. Her fried chicken and her biscuits and gravy and her friends were just, their mouth was watering. And I said, hey, Ginny, tell me about your healthy food. And she goes, what, rabbit food? Like salad and celery? And I said, the problem is that you're associating pain to the stuff that'll get you thinner. You gotta switch your strategy. She looked at me like I had two heads, but she came back three weeks later and she's all smiles. I said, Ginny, why are you smiling? She says, I'm down seven pounds. And I said, what have you been doing? She says, let me tell you about my Hawaiian buffet. I get my wooden bowls, I get my greens from the garden, my little goodies, my glass of water with a slice of uh, sunshine on there with my lemon. I feel like I'm on vacation. And I said, well, what about your fried chicken? And she says, oh, that makes me feel greasy. See, she changed her strategy. She changed the way she trained her brain. So we want to make sure of that. Now, I had a guy who was helping to think more positively. And he comes up to me one day and he says, Tim, I don't think this stuff is working. And I said, well, tell me what you did. And he said, well, he said, I was at home and I, something bad happened. And I said, you know what? Everything's going to be okay. I am a winner. I'm a good person. 
oh, this is stupid, I'm an idiot, and this, nothing works out for me, and this whole thing is just dumb. Notice where the energy went. Not only do you focus on what you want, not only do you associate pleasure to the goal, but you have to speak passionately about what you want. If you only speak passionately about what you're afraid of, then that's where the energy goes. So again, you have to focus on what you want and speak positively about it. Now, when you're trying to manage yourself, you're going to come up with fear. Now, for me, fear, F-E-A-R, stood for F everything and run. I had to learn how to change it to feeling excited and ready. So I've learned some really fast ways of changing the way you feel. And one thing that I notice is that you can't experience anxiety without speed. You have to speed up inside. You have to focus on the scariest thing happening and often hold your breath. Now, if you want to have the opposite, calm, cool, and collected, then you breathe through your nose and you look up. In fact, I dare you to do it, okay? Look up and try to get scared about anything. I can't think of anything. You will notice that every time you look up, it gets quiet inside. The only time this doesn't work is when you're driving, so remember that going home. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we look up to feel more peaceful and at ease. The third thing that I want to share with you is that no matter what else you do, love and accept yourself. We have this deep insecurity in all, in all of us, this deep down fear that all the other ones come from, that somehow in some way I'm not enough. And I am here to tell you that you are. It's not what happens to you in your life. It's the meaning that you give to it that matters more than anything else. There was this kid, and he's walking down the street, and he's got a stick, and he sees a ball. He picks up the ball, he throws it in the air. He swings, and he totally misses. He picks up that ball again, steadies himself, throws it up, watches, swings, misses again. <sighs> picks up that ball one more time, throws it up, gets ready, swings, <sighs> misses again. Starts to get really upset, and then he realizes... Whoa, what a picture. So sometimes what we need to do is just close our eyes, go inside, and stop chasing validation from everybody else. If you want love, if you want approval, give it to yourself. Go in and check with that little boy or girl inside of you and find out what do they need from you. Love, support, protection, encouragement, give it to them. There's these four philanthropists, and they're this other village just came over and took them over and they took all their young men and they put them in these horrible little prisons and the men were so sick and cold and laying on the ground and starving one of the philanthropists said we can't put up with this and so he went over to the guard and he says you know what he says I've got these wells of clean water take them but please give our men something to drink because they're just they need clean water so he said fine so now the men are in their prisons and they got clean water the second philanthropist said, I want in on this. And so that philanthropist walked over as well and said, you know what? I've got these uh, fields of grain. And if you just give our men some bread, then at least they won't starve to death. And so the guard said, okay, fine. The third philanthropist said, I want in on this too. And so he walked over to the guards and said, hey, you know what? I've got these textile mills. If you just give them some blankets so that they're not on the ground then you can take the textile mills. And so they said, fine. So now the men had this water and this bread and this blanket to lay on in these prisons. But the fourth philanthropist, she said, you know what? This isn't right. This is not right. She waited till the middle of the night. She walked over to the guard. She bribed them with all the money she had. And she got the keys. And she went and she opened the doors and she set the men free. Because ladies and gentlemen, the goal in your life is not to figure out how to be comfortable in your mental prisons but to realize that you have the keys to set yourself free. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.